So our next presentation really speaks to this new world that we are living in, because I'm about to introduce somebody who is in Canberra and is going to be speaking to us this morning, not from this stage, but from his home in Canberra. And this section session is entitled Section 128, What It Says and What That Means to You. Dr. Michael Eburn, Barrister and Honorary Associate Professor with ANU College of Law, joins us via the uh, medium of Zoom to chat with us. Michael is a barrister, uh, as I said, an honorary professor at ANU. He served with St. John's Ambulance, New South Wales, New South Wales Ambulance and the New South Wales SES. And he is well known to the emergency services sector through his research funded by the Bushfire and Natural Hazards CRC. His book, Emergency Law, uh, is also something that he is known for as well as numerous legal journal papers. His most read work is his blog. It is a legal blog. It is entitled Australian Emergency Law. It is an invaluable resource providing commentary on the law and answering legal questions from emergency service volunteers and staff. In the past year, uh, he has been studying a Cert three in electronics and communication. And he tells me he also took on a new job and a new skill as a casual bus driver with Transport Canberra. However, as you're about to hear, uh, Michael's greatest skill as a lawyer is his natural ability to present complex legal issues in an easy to understand manner and in plain English. Uh, so his presentation today is in plain English and it is entitled Section 128 and Ex Parti and Equitable Constructive Trust, Raise of Salocata Unenforceable Liens and its arbitrary ab initio impact on the fire extinguishment of prothonotary compliance with subsection 29, subsection 3 of the Lord Morris of Borthy Just Distinctions Act. So you'll understand exactly what it is all about. <laughs> Michael, I just, I just made that up. And what, yeah, what, you, don't realize, what, what you don't realise is just as I did, uh, your face was obscured by a window on Zoom, yeah. but we can now see I you see absolutely see perfectly. Can you hear me okay? Yes, you are loud and clear. Excellent. In that case, Michael, I'm going to hand over to you on the Zoom line virtually. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a virtual welcome or a live welcome to my learned friend, the always honourable Dr. Michael Eburn. Michael, over to you. Uh, cheers. So thanks for that, uh, everyone. There's a bit of a gap between the sound, and but I'm sure it'll work out. Um, First of all, I apologise for not being there in person. That was the original plan. But in these COVID days, it seemed wiser not to, particularly as I was in Goulburn on the 24th of May, uh, which, uh, if you've been looking at the hotspots, was also time someone with COVID was there. Um, so it seemed better not to be there. OK, I'm going to share a screen with you and talk to a set of PowerPoints. The problem with being a lawyer is that... Um, we work in words. I've never been very good at putting pictures. So lots of words, but hopefully I'll translate them. And no pressure from that introduction about putting it into plain English, because we're certainly not starting with plain English. So the theme that I was asked to address was section 128, what it says and what it means to you. So let's start with what it says. And it says this, uh, a matter or thing done by or a, a protected person or body does not, if the matter or thing was done in good faith for the purposes of executing any provision other than section 33 of this act or any other act, subject to such person personally or the crown to any section liability claim or demand. Uh, and section 1A deals with the forestry corporation rather than the rural fire service. And we don't need to talk about that. So there you go. That's what it says. Um, but uh, as, the, as the chair said, You've got to translate that into plain English because like lots of uh, legislative drafting, it's not all that clear. So let's start with section 33 and why is it not there? Why is this any section other than section 33? Well, section 33 is about voluntary work by rural fire brigades. It says, in effect, the rural fire brigade may voluntarily operate with a public authority in the executing of any function of that public authority. So the RFS can be asked by other state government agencies to help do things. Um, and if they want to help, they can. Um, that might be helping out with your local council. It might be, who knows? Um, certainly in this all hazards, all agencies type response, it might be um, helping the SES, helping ambulance, um, 
helping the Environmental Protection Authority, uh, you name it. So why is that excluded from the Act? Because most of those Acts have their own indemnity provisions, and it says whatever indemnity provisions are in the Bose Acts extend to the RFS. And secondly, if the RFS are helping a public authority and someone wants to complain that they've done something badly or negligently, uh, the authority for whom they were working will wear it. So basically, it's it's avoiding a confusion that if the R, if an RFS brigade is doing something for the benefit of another government agency, which indemnity provision applies, it's that agency. So the fact that Section 33 is excluded is pretty irrelevant, and we can move past it. So then we go back to 128, which talked about a protected person. Who's a protected person? We get a list that looks like this. Again, um, I was told I was going to speak in plain English. Reading that list is not plain English. Let's translate it. What it says really is the Crown, the Commissioner, and the member of the service. What's significant about that list reduced to that simple term is it says the Crown is protected. So what the state of New South Wales is doing is saying, um, if the rural fire service responds, the members act in a good faith attempt to do the functions that they've been assigned, none of us are liable. So it extends to protect the state and the agency that is the rural fire service not just the volunteers. We can compare that to legislation, for example, the legislation governing the Country Fire Authority and Victoria SES uh, in Victoria. The legislation in that state says that you cannot take a legal action against a volunteer, but you can still sue the authority. So a Country Fire Authority firefighter is protected, but the Country Fire Authority itself is not. Same with Victoria SES. So, um, New South Wales has taken a different approach uh, to Victoria. And interestingly, if you look at uh, civil liability legislation, which is broader, uh, again, New South Wales takes a more restrictive approach. Um, New South Wales is very much trying to say, um, if you get injured um, by the state or by a volunteer and they're protected, uh, you actually can't claim a remedy against anybody. Whereas the other states say, well, you can't claim a remedy against the volunteer, but you can claim a remedy against the agency they were volunteering for. I'll leave it to you to decide which is a fairer process. You've just got to imagine case scenarios and ask yourself, how do you think it should work out? Why do we need it? Well, it goes back to a case called Vaughan and Webb decided in 1902. In Vaughan and Webb, a fire brigade superintendent uh, exercised authority that was granted to firefighters and is still granted to firefighters uh, to knock down a wall. Basically, there'd been a fire, structural damage, the wall is unsafe. If you look at the Rural Fires Act, if you look at the... Uh, Fire and Rescue New South Wales Act, you look at any fire brigade legislation, the officer in charge, the commissioner, however it's described, has the power to knock down walls to render sites safe. So this superintendent said, words in his own mind, I suppose, I'm going to knock down this wall. It was done in such a way that the wall fell onto property of a neighbour damaging it and the neighbor sued for damages. It's a, it's a thing we hear all the time in this modern world, everybody's suing, you know, it's actually not that new or modern. We've been doing it forever. Um, I've traced some history of litigation against fire brigades. It goes back well into the last two centuries. Um, you know, the first litigation in Australia was when a convict on the first fleet sued to get his luggage returned to him. So I don't think that litigation is a new or modern phenomenon. We've been doing it for a long time. So this was 1902. Uh, the person whose property was injured, sued and won. And the, the fire service argued that the superintendent was acting in good faith. He was doing 
what he thought he had to do. He weighed up the situation, said this wall's got to come down. It was a genuine effort to perform the functions of a fire brigade. But the court held that good faith or good intention is not a defence to a claim of negligence. Just because you're trying hard is not enough. The law of negligence says you have to act reasonably in all the circumstances, and it's an objective test um, to be assessed by, you know, what would the reasonable person have done? Now, the court in Vaughan and Webb's uh, Chief Justice Stephen said that a step defendant would not be liable if the wall could not have been pulled down without injury to the plaintiff. So if you've got a piece of legislation, and you do, that gives you all sorts of powers, and to exercise those powers necessarily requires damaging someone else's property, well, you're allowed to do it. So think cutting fences. The Rural Fire Service Act says you can cut fences if you need to. And clearly, you might need to because you want to drive a fire appliance across somebody's paddock to get to the fire. And the way to do it is you cut the fence and you drive through. But you can't, you can't cut. Cutting the fence necessarily causes damage to their property. There's no way you can cut a fence and not cause damage to their property. You can't be liable for the damage. But in this case, he could have pulled the wall down, presumably in ways that would have caused it to go the other direction and not fall on the neighbor's property. The court said, well, he wouldn't be liable if there was no alternative, but there was an alternative and he didn't think about it sufficiently and try and work out how do I do this without damaging the neighbor's property? And so there was liability. Well, it was in response to that, that ever since then, fire brigade legislation has put in a clause like 128 that says, if you're acting in good faith, you're not liable. So they're just trying to reverse the rule in Vaughan and Webb. They're trying to say, well, we don't want either the fire service or the firefighter to be liable if they're acting honestly. You know, they've thought about you know, what is it I'm meant to be doing. I'm doing my best. If it turns out later, I could have done it another way. That's fine. And we know why that is. It's because you, as you know better than I do, when you're on a fire ground, you've got no time to make decisions. An honest attempt is good enough. So let me just turn my notes over so I know what's coming next. So we end up with a clause like section 128. Now, there are some times when it doesn't apply, but they don't extend to traffic accidents. And again, how do I know that? Because the High Court said so in a case called the Board of Fire Commissioners and Arduin decided in 1961. That involved a collision between a fire appliance and a motorcycle. What the High Court said is we're going to read these sorts of clauses as as strictly as we can do. We, you know, if there's any ambiguity in the language, we're going to read it really tight. We're going to really read it really tight because it's denying people um, what would otherwise be their rights to recover. And as I said, in New South Wales, um, if you suffer not losses caused negligently by a volunteer, not only can you not sue the volunteer, you can't sue the agency they volunteer for. You know, you've got no remedy. Uh, and you might think that's pretty tough. So anyway, the reason the High Court interpreting these this sort of legislation said it really doesn't apply to motor vehicle accidents is because we have comprehensive motor vehicle insurance schemes. You pay for it every time you register your car and you buy a green slip. What you're doing is you're paying for insurance to cover people who are injured in motor vehicle accidents. The Rural Fire Service is also covered. Rural Fire Service appliances don't need to be registered, but there is a scheme set up um, to ensure that they're insured under the compulsory third party motor accident scheme. So if you get hit by a car, you're entitled to claim compensation. You don't really sue the driver, you really sue their CTP insurer. If they're not insured, there's a scheme set up to still make sure that the injured pedestrian, other road user gets covered. If something like section 128 extended to motor vehicle accidents, if you got hit by a fire appliance, you get nothing. And why should that be when every other, in fact, motor vehicle accident compensation is now a no fault scheme. You don't even have to prove negligence. Um, why would we exclude people who get hit by a fire truck? 
It's no difference to being hit by your private car. You've got CTP insurance. The fire truck's carrying CTP insurance. There's a whole statutory scheme set up to, injure, to compensate people who are injured in motor vehicle accidents. It would just be perverse if you couldn't get compensation because the car that hit you happened to be a fire appliance. So it doesn't extend to motor vehicle accidents. If you get hit by a fire appliance, you can still make a claim under the Motor Accidents Act and you still get the compensation just like anybody else would. It also doesn't extend to criminal liability. And we know that from a case called Work Cover Against New South Wales, against the New South Wales Fire Brigades. Um, many of you, I suspect, will have heard about this. It was a silo fire up Newcastle Way um, when the fire brigade were, were really unsure of how to deal with this fire. Um, some poor workers opened an inspection hatch on the silo that was burning. Um, opening the inspection hatch introduced a massive amount of oxygen. There was an explosion. The factory workers were killed. Some firefighters were exposed to a danger. Um, it's a credit, I think, to the fire brigade's PPE um, that they weren't injured. Their, all their gear worked. Um, but uh, the fire brigades were taken to task for not having given their staff proper training in how to deal with this sort of thing. Um, the poor old firefighters were really making it up on the run. I understand they, they're much better trained on silo fires now, and hopefully as the rural fire service, so are you. But the fire brigade tried to rely on their indemnity, with their equivalent of section 128, of course, it's a different section, but they tried to rely on it and the court went through it all and said, really, this does not extend to criminal liability when it talks about a claim or action, it's talking about a claim for money damages um, now, that's not universally true um, in the Northern Territory. The equivalent section says it extends to criminal damages. And if you've been paying attention to the outcome of the summer black, black summer bushfires, where there's been legislative changes to increase um, the role of the ADF, the ADF are exempted from criminal liability. So legislatures can extend this to criminal liability. Um, but they haven't in all cases, and certainly in 128, it would not extend to criminal uh, actions. And interestingly enough, the courts have said it, they don't extend to doing things that are not required, that do not require legislative authority. So things you can do without reference to legislation, or particularly the fire brigade's legislation, uh, are not covered. So again, if you read if you look at the sorts of powers that are given to a fire brigade at the scene of a fire that involve interference with people's rights, closing roads, cutting fences, knocking down buildings, cutting fire breaks, all those sorts of things would be uh, unlawful if you didn't have permission or some sort of legislative authority. Um, and it's those sorts of actions that are protected. Things that you don't actually need the Rural Fires Act to do are not protected. And so Arduin, uh, said there's nothing in the Rural Fires Act about driving. Driving a fire appliance is not actually um, provided for in the Rural Fires Act, so it's not what's covered. Interestingly enough, Stevens and Stevens, 1970, um, the issue was actually about fighting a fire. And the court said there's nothing in the Rural Fires Act that talks about fighting fires. Uh, and you don't need authority to fight a fire. Anyone can fight a fire. Um, and so uh, when in Stevens and Stevens, they'd parked their fire appliance on the side of the road, they were off on the road fighting the fire. Uh, a car came around in the smoke, ran up the back of the appliance. Um, the court said that the then equivalent section didn't apply um, because actually fighting a fire was not performing a function of the act. Now the act's probably a bit different now. Um, but the principle is still the same. It, this section applies, uh, if we go back to what it says, I'll just go back a few. Sorry, we're just going back to actually get the language of the act. Oh, this shall just take a second. Right. Um, 
it has to be done for the purposes of executing a provision of this or any other act. And so, for example, driving a vehicle is not provided for in a provision in the act. And if it's not, if you can't point your finger to a section of the act that says, that's the section I was doing, then you're not going to get the benefit of the section. Again, uh, that's probably not significant, and I'll come to that why that. So when has it been applied? Let's actually think about it as a test. And the answer is it's not been applied very often because the Royal Fire Service and rarely get sued. Um, every time it has been sued, courts have actually said um, they're not liable for other reasons. Um, and well, I'll address that in just a second. So when has it been applied? The most significant case is West against New South Wales. 2014, Australian Capital Territory Court of Appeal. Um, and it, there's a litigation arising out of the 2003 Canberra fires. And the original defendants were both the ACT and the New South Wales. The fires occurred in the ACT. That's why it's in the ACT court, even though the defendant is New South Wales, and even though they were considering New South Wales law. So uh, fires broke out, I think, on the 8th of uh, January uh, 2003. On the 18th of January, they burn into Canberra uh, and do a considerable amount of damage. There's some litigation basically alleging that the decisions of the incident controller when the fire first started were negligent. Uh, again, it was a case that was actually decided on the basis that there was no negligence, so there could be no liability, but the court talked about if there was negligence, would 128 apply? And they agreed that it would. Her Honour Justice Jago said, uh, the requirement of good faith requires a real attempt to discharge the required function and more than honest ineptitude. So that language comes from another case uh, involving a council, nothing to do with fires at all, where someone had asked council about information to do with their land. Uh, council had replied saying, no, we don't know anything about that. It turned out they had a huge number of records showing that there was a hazard on the land. Um, the court said that wasn't good faith, that was honest ineptitude of just writing saying, no, we've got no information without actually going and looking at the information. So Her Honour Justice Jago has picked up the same language. She says, You've got, to be, you've got to be trying, you've got to be thinking about it if you're actually just ignoring it. So if you say, you know, it's hard to think of an example, but, um, um, oh, well, I'll think of an, of an example from a recent case. Um, you've run up, you've conducted a fire, you know, there's a risk that tree stumps can smolder and get fire in the roots. Um, a real attempt to discharge the required function is you go and check it and you come to the conclusion there's no risk of fire. Um, but you didn't do that very well. Well, that's, an on, that's a real attempt to discharge it. If you go, oh, I just couldn't be bothered going to look, I'm sure it'll be right. That might be honest ineptitude. So you need to do, there needs to be some evidence you were doing something to try and perform the function of the act. Um, what else we learned from Western New South Wales is that it, Section 128 is a defence. Because it's a defence, what we lawyers say is he who asserts must prove. So if you're going to assert the defence, I'm protected by Section 128, you've got to bring the evidence. So it's not like that the, the person who's suing has to prove there was an absence of good faith. The defendant, you, the RFS, has to show there was good faith. But, said the court, doesn't mean you have to call specific evidence. You don't have to ask, in this case, the incident controller, you know, what were you thinking? You can draw the inference from all the evidence. And the evidence in West's case was everybody was trying really hard. The fact that some, you know, what you might call later, some mistakes were made, some information was inaccurate, and then of course information is inaccurate, that doesn't deny good faith. And there was no need to call and actually ask each witness, you know, were you trying really hard? You can draw the inference from all the evidence about what was going on. And finally, uh, still from this case, Her Honour Justice Katzman said this. Uh, certainly you can be negligent but acting in good faith, and that has to be true, because if it was not true, the section would never have anything to do. So good faith can be made out with the relevant person does or fails to do something honestly, in good conscience. They, they honestly think it's the best thing to do. They're not acting for any improper or ulterior purpose. They're not going, beauty, I don't like the neighbour. I'm just going to let that fire run because that'll burn their house out and they've been annoying me for months. That would not be good faith. But if you're, you know, you've got whatever the situation is in front of you, whether you're, whether you're a, a captain on the, on the truck or the incident controller in the IMT, you go, these are the options. We're going to do this one. 
it turns out that it was a poor call, that's still good faith and that's what's protected. Uh, when else was it protected? Here's some other cases. Warragamba Winery um, involved a fire in Warragamba, burned into the town. Um, Woodhouse and Fitzgerald is one a recent case involving that very example that I gave you of a, a, a tree where fire was caught deep in the roots. Um, Section 128 wasn't really the defining issue in either of those cases, though, because the court just said there was no negligence. You know, the decisions that were all made were all made reasonably, even though the fire, in fact, burned into Warragamba, and even though, in fact, it turned out this tree stump was still smouldering and started a further fire. But the court said, but if there had been negligence, 128 would have also helped. In fact, in Woodhouse and Fitzgerald, um, the RFS were not sued because everyone just agreed 128 was going to cover them. And so it actually became a dispute between the landholders. Um, so the court didn't decide 128 didn't apply, uh, 128 applied. Everybody, all the litigants agreed that 128 applied and they couldn't sue the fire service. That fire service were acting in good faith um, and the court went on saying they weren't negligent anyway. Um, those next two cases, my stores and the State Fire Commission uh, applied section 121 of, the, of their act. Um, and that was where firefighters in the Myers store in Hobart turned off sprinklers, even though they hadn't yet located the scene of the fire. And they did that because the sprinklers um, were pouring water all over everything and there was still electricity connected to the building. Uh, and so it was dangerous. And so they said, turn the sprinklers off um, so we can go in. And there are reasons why they couldn't turn the power off. Uh, Hamcor in Queensland, um, the fire brigade were attempting to extinguish a fire at a factory. They were flooding it with water. By flooding it with water, they caused a whole lot of really nasty chemicals to flow off site uh, into the nearby water course. The owner of the factory was obliged under environmental protection legislation to meet the cost of the cleanup of the land. His argument was it would have been cheaper for me if you'd done nothing because if it had burnt, it would have, just, it would have gone up in smoke. It wouldn't have gone into the waterway. Um, your presence actually cost me a whole lot more because the factory was still a total loss either way. Uh, and the court again said, fairly irrelevant. Uh, the fire brigade were there to extinguish the fire. They had a whole lot of choices. Um, either way, there was an environmental risk, whether you're putting pollution into the air or putting pollution into the water. Um, it really wasn't their call to try and work out which one would be better for you as the factory owner. It was their call to do what they thought was best. They thought the best thing to do was flood the fire brigade fire with water, that being basically the only tool they had, they were protected. So what we know is, in fact, that fire, brig fire brigades get sued incredibly rarely. When they do, they win. Firefighters never get sued. Um, Section 128 should provide some com comfort to firefighters uh, in any event. When hasn't, hasn't it been applied? I've lost track of time, so I hope, and I, all I can see is my screen. So if someone wants to jump and wave at me, that would be fine. When hasn't it been applied? A couple of cases, Lobsey and Care, a motor vehicle report. That was under the older legislation. But what happened there was the brigade captain was doing a hazard reduction burn on his own property. He didn't do anything that he was required to do under the Act. Um, when a vehicle traveling through the smoke had a collision which actually killed someone, um, that brigade captain tried to argue that he was relying on the Bush Fires Act as it then was. Um, and the court said, no, you weren't. You were, this was entirely for your own interest. Um, you hadn't complied with the act or attempted to comply with the act in any way, shape or form. The mere fact that you're a brigade captain is pretty irrelevant when you're lighting fires on your own property without any basic attempt at care. So he was not protected. And one that's really important to you and that I spoke about in the, uh, whenever the last RFSA conference was, certainly not last year, is the Queen and Wells, uh, which was, as you would be familiar with, is a fatal collision with a fire appliance on the Newcastle motorway. Um, and Section 128 didn't provide any application there, partly because it was a criminal matter, partly because it was a motor vehicle accident matter. Um, uh, so it just didn't arise. And if it did, it probably, it wouldn't have covered it anyway because, uh, for a whole lot of reasons that I've discussed earlier, but I think we can just sit with the fact that it doesn't apply to criminal matters uh, and traffic matters. 
firefighters have other protections. So even if section 128, for whatever reason, doesn't apply, there's still the doctrine of vicarious liability because you're operating as part of the rural fire service. When people ring for a fire brigade, they're not ringing you, they're ringing the rural fire service. The rural fire service sends you, then any liability belongs to the state. And we saw that it was Western New South Wales. It was Warragamba Winery and New South Wales. Nobody's suing firefighters. The Civil Liability Act protects volunteers and it protects those who are exercising special statutory powers. So the sorts of powers you've got as a fire brigade uh, to damage walls, cut fences, take water, do all of those sorts of things are special statutory powers and you're given further protection about those. Uh, and of course there's compulsory third party motor vehicle insurance, which says if you crash the fire appliance, even if it's your fault, you don't pay for that. Um, the New South Wales Treasury Managed Fund pays for it. Uh, and that's the same if you're driving your own car, your CTP insurer pays for it. So you've got all these extra protections. So, so what does 128 mean for you? Well, it's part of a suite of laws that says you're never liable. Fire services are rarely liable. Even if actions in hindsight, uh, in hindsight, you kind of think, well, could have done that better. Wasn't the best decision. Criminal matters accepted, rural fire service volunteers are legally protected. So that's what 128 means for you. 